This represents enough nerve poison to kill every living thing in the country, a goal that becomes more and more desirable for Syria every passing day because of its continued swing toward a more fundamental form of Islam. There is absolutely nothing to stop Syria from obliterating Israel except... 1. The threat of retaliation. 2. The political repercussions of killing Israel's Palestinian Arab population. And, of course, 3. The restraining influence of the Holy Spirit. After the rapture, however, point 3 will no longer be a factor. And as World War 3 gets underway, points 1 and 2 will evaporate. It will take about a nanosecond for a frustrated Syrian leadership to decide what to do with these chemical weapons. Then why don't we read about the obliteration of Israel in Scripture? because it never takes place. Did you ever hear the expression, history repeats itself? In the case of future history, biblical prophecy, it happens all the time. The only time the phrase West Wind occurs in the entire Bible is in a reference to a plague, or more precisely, the elimination of a plague. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt, and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and Yahweh brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over the land of Egypt, and rested on the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. So there remained nothing green on the trees, or on the plants of the field, throughout all of the land of Egypt. Okay, so far we have a plague of unprecedented proportions descending upon the nation where the Israelites happened to be living. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you. Now therefore please forgive my sin only this once and entreat Yahweh your God that he may take away from me this death only. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated Yahweh, and Yahweh turned a very strong west wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all of the territory of Egypt, but Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go. Exodus 10, 12-20 By sending a very strong west wind, Yahweh removed the plague. Now, let's go back to our Syrian VX scenario. What would God do if they actually pushed the button? I submit to you that he would do exactly what he did in Exodus, send a very strong west wind. Net effect, Israel is spared. Jordan, directly east of Israel, is annihilated. Just a guess, you understand. Give all of that one a speculation factor of nine. All of this is but a prelude to the fall of the rest of the gods of the earth, something we have come to group under the umbrella title Babylon, representing the sum total of man's false worship, religious and otherwise. The few who remain will begin to understand the promise of Yahweh made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. In summary, let's examine one more cryptic prophecy from Isaiah, one that has not yet been fulfilled. But they, this is Judah and Ephraim together, that is Israel, shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines, apparently the Gaza Strip, toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east, perhaps Jordan, They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. Isaiah 11.14 Whatever else this may entail, it's clear that the Palestinians are no longer going to be a thorn in Israel's side. I believe that this is a condition that will persist throughout the millennium. 
But when does it start? At the risk of getting ahead of our story, it is entirely possible that a severely depopulated Jordan will become the primary wilderness refuge for the Israelis as they flee from the Antichrist after the middle of the tribulation, with more hiding out among the ruins of the Gaza Strip. But the Antichrist is their ally, isn't he? Why would they have to flee? (laughs) Well, it's a long story. I'll tell you later. Arabia is a tough one to figure out. We have seen, in Ezekiel 38.13, that Saudi Arabia, with a few other nations, will lodge diplomatic protests against Gog's belligerence during the opening days of World War III. We have also seen that Jeremiah named several Arabian nations in a list of those who would experience judgment. To recap... Take this wine cup of fury from my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them, Dedan, Tima, Buzz, and all who are in the farthest corners, all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mixed multitude who dwell in the desert, all the kings of Zimri. Jeremiah 25:15 and 16 23 through 24. Because the judgments pronounced extend beyond the actual Babylonian conquest that occasioned the prophecy in the first place, I concluded that these nations, as well as the others on Jeremiah's list, all discussed in the previous chapter, will find themselves on the losing side in the War of Magog. Despite their diplomatic stance, the Antichrist will know that, as a potential threat to Israel, and hence to his own demigod aspirations, Saudi can't be ignored. They've built a sprawling missile base at Sulayil, about 500 kilometers south of Riyadh, employing a huge staff of Chinese workers installing about 120 CSS-2 Dongfen-3 missiles and a dozen or more launchers. Each of these missiles can carry three or more nuclear, biological, or chemical warheads. With a range of about 3,500 kilometers, these missiles can reach as far as Libya, Greece, or portions of India. Israel, they could hit blindfolded. The Saudis are rumored to have funded Pakistan's nuclear weapons program, so it's not much of a stretch to envision Pakistani nukes on top of their Chinese missiles, all paid for with American oil dollars. Therefore, whether or not they actually intend to use their sophisticated weapons against Israel, and my guess is that they're not because they have nothing to gain and everything to lose, the Antichrist will be reticent to take any chances. Saudi Arabia, at least its military installations, will find themselves on the Antichrist's nuclear hit parade. And yet we find passages, like these two in Isaiah, that seem to indicate that the nations of the Arabian Peninsula will be among those who, in the end, turn around and honor Yahweh. The multitude of camels shall cover your land, and dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of Yahweh. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you. The rams of Neboath shall minister to you. They shall ascend with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Isaiah 60, 6 and 7. Or how about this? In the wilderness and its cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Selah sing. Let them shout from the tops of the mountains. Let them give glory to Yahweh and declare his praise in the coastlands. Isaiah 42, 11 and 12. This is way more significant than it appears at first glance. Arabia is the birthplace of Islam, the home of that perverse doctrine's two most revered sites, Mecca and Medina. What's more, the princes of Saudi have been instrumental in underwriting the financial burden of world Islamic terrorism, a fact to which our geniuses in Washington turn a blind eye in order to keep the black ooze flowing freely. 
For Saudi to end up honoring Yahweh, it's kind of like the Vatican announcing they've all decided to become Lutherans. It represents a complete about-face. In short, it signals the death of the most vile and destructive pseudo-religion on the face of the globe, one that before the bloodbath of World War III held over 1.3 billion souls in spiritual bondage. This is exactly the kind of outcome most Christians would love to see, but would never dream was possible. That's due to a lack of faith on our part, not to a lack of power on Yahweh's. If Arabia turns from Islam to the worship of Yahweh, the mandatory Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca, one of the five pillars of Islam, will cease. In short, if you cut off its head, the beast can't live for long. Modern Iran is composed primarily of ancient Media, Elam, and Persia. A few chapters back, we discussed the evidence identifying Iran with the nation of Magog, the leading nation in the invasion force whose adventures are detailed so vividly in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Since Magog is a major player in World War III, I half expected to see a plethora of vituperative prophecies outlining Iran's demise. I found no such thing. The only nations who are specifically denounced in Scripture are the ones whose historic progenitors were antagonistic toward Israel. So the Medes are mentioned only as participants in the overthrow of Babylon. The Persians, partners with the Medes in the Babylonian conquest, are given a bit more press. Their eventual ascendancy over their allies to the northwest and everybody else in the Middle East earned them a place in Daniel's prophecies as the second great Gentile kingdom. But they were never really an enemy of Israel. They inherited the land from Babylon and generally treated the Jews well, although there was that one close call during the reign of Ahasuerus, a.k.a. Xerxes, detailed in the book of Esther. But that was apparently precipitated by satanic trickery, not an anti-Israel predisposition. Consequently, Scripture has nothing to say about Persia's specific role in the last days. Likewise, next to nothing is said about Elam. But they must have been a part of Israel's problem at one time, for Jeremiah reports... Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four corners of heaven, and scatter them towards those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster on them, my fierce anger, says Yahweh, and I will send the sword after them until they have consumed them. I will set my throne in Elam, and I will destroy from there the king and the princes, says Yahweh. But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam, says Yahweh. Jeremiah 49, 35-39 That last phrase, bring back the captives of Elam, can be misleading. Some loose English translations take it to mean restore the fortunes of Elam, as in the NIV. But this reading doesn't mesh very well with what immediately preceded it. I would suggest that the captives of Elam really means Elam's captives, that is, the Jews who were exiled there under Babylon's brutal reign. Consider this parallel passage from Isaiah. It shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros, Upper Egypt, and Cush, East Africa, from Elam, southern Iran, and Shinar, Babylon, or Iraq, from Hamath, Syria, and the islands of the sea, most notably America. Isaiah 11.11 11. It's clear to me that the imprecation against Elam is the direct result of the shabby treatment the Jews in exile received at the hands of the Elamites. 
The bottom line is that for the most part, the nations comprising Iran's heritage had little friction with historic Israel. This explains why Yahweh inspired Ezekiel to use a distinct and ancient name for the region's inhabitants, Magog, when describing the Islamic hordes who would ultimately submit to Satan's command to go and perish on the mountains of Israel.